Good day. I'm Professor Dunn. We'll be talking about back pain and sciatica. Firstly, remember that back pain is not a diagnosis, but a symptom or complaint. And many causes, and there are many causes of back pain. Of the many patients with back pain, most will present to primary care level, including physiotherapists, nursing staff managers, and primary care doctors. And very few of these will require any form of investigation and spinal surgery. However, the economic burden is massive, although it's extremely old data. Australia have reported that in the six-month period, 10% of adults suffered significant disability from back pain, with costs in the order of $1 billion Australian dollars, mostly spent on chiropractors, GPs, and other primary th therapists. But in taking the loss of work uh, productivity, the cost can be seen around $8 billion Aussie dollars a year. In the United Kingdom, with a public-based health system, 12 million workdays are lost a year by 300,000 people. This is a population similar to the size of South Africa. A million of these patients um, consult their GPs a year for back pain, of which 300,000 referred to hospital, 30,000 admitted, and only 5,000 came to surgery. This might be a little low being a public health system, and if there was private access, maybe it'd be a little higher. There are many surgical options available which are enticing and it's very important to match the patient with the appropriate treatment which may vary from reassurance counseling to surgical intervention. The success of any intervention is based on a thorough diagnosis, dealing with patient expectations, offering the correct uh, therapeutic modality and considering risk and benefit. When dealing with diagnosis, we need to understand the underlying conditions. Here you can see the uh, diagrams of the lumbar spine. This is looking from the lateral side. Here we have the vertebral body, another vertebral body with the disc in between the two. You can see the intimate relationship between the vertebral body and disc and the foramen. So you can see over here how the nerve root will exit the neural foramen and any pathology of the facet joint or the disc may compress that nerve root causing pain. Here's an axial view where you can see the cord equina and the exiting nerve roots and again the intimate relationship of the disc and if this pathology may cause problems here. As we age these discs will lose water content as the proteins degenerate. With that, there will be mechanical changes with loss of disc height and osteophyte formation. This is normal aging process, which in some people may cause symptoms. This is represented on the x-ray. Here you can see a lateral x-ray with the virtual body osteophytes, which is normal aging process. Here we can see the disc space. And as we come down, these two discs at L4-5, the disc at 4-5, and L5 is one on narrowed. Again, this, this is a normal aging process, and this patient may or may not have symptoms. The x-ray does not indicate pain, simply degenerative changes, which may or may not be symptomatic. Here's an AP x-ray. Again, the discs can be seen between the vertebral bodies, and down at L4-5 and 5-1, they diminished due to the osteophytes and degenerative process. The MRI scan allows us to visualize the discs and neurological structures far better. You can see on the sequence, again, a sagittal view equivalent to the lateral x-ray. You can see normal discs, which are well hydrated on this T2 sequence where water is white. You can see the water in the discs, which are normal. And at L4-5 and L5-S1, there's is loss of water signal showing the degeneration. As your facets degenerate, they may cause pain in typical arthritic type pain of a deep ache. The disc itself may also degenerate in, in the wall and the soft nucleus pulposus may herniate through causing a disc herniation and press on an isolated nerve root which may cause sciatica. Sciatica is different to back pain. Back pain would be pain in the, in the back itself of the, of the spine where sciatica will cause pain in the buttock, down the leg, post your thigh into the calf in an S1 distribution. If the L5-S1 disc 
pushes on the L on the S1 nerve bridge, or the L45 level may cause L5 nerve, nerve bridge symptoms when the pain will go buttock down the lateral aspect of the thigh and calf to the top of the foot. As we age, our normal spine will degenerate like this. Our facet joints will become arthrit arthritic, hypertrophy, and cause some compression of the cord equina. The cord equina is filled with CSF and nerve roots and can accommodate a certain amount of compression before it's symptomatic. When assessing patients who present with the complaints of back pain or leg pain, we need to decide is there a mechanical or axial component or is it largely nerve compression? Mechanical symptoms are due to the structural part of the spine where the discs, facet joints, ligaments and muscles um, are degenerate or injured and this sort of deep back pain will often improve with rest. Nerve root compression is an irritation of the spinal nerve roots usually as they're exiting the cord equina and out the foramen. may be caused by a ruptured disc or osteophytes from the edges of the end plates. They usually present with pain, numbness, weakness down the, the lower limb. The may, patient may have positive tension signs when doing a straight leg raise test and can either be a radiculopathy, in other words a single nerve root uh, which is causing symptoms, or a more global spinal stenosis where the entire cord equina is compressed which gives a rather more vague bilateral lower limb symptomatology. When assessing patients, we need a complete history as the first step and then proceed to examination, special investigations. This is a bit of a recap from our talk on the spinal consultation in your first week, but the history is about data gathering to obtain a diagnosis, identifying comorbidities that may have an impact on possible surgical intervention, developing an insight into patient's makeup so we can decide whether the patient will do well with surgery or not, and establishing a good patient-doctor relationship which has a positive impact on our surgical outcome and reduction of risks of litigation. The best is to start with the current complaint which is generally expressed by the patient or the parent in the case of a child or the carer in case of an older patient. Typically this will either be pain or loss of function and we need to interrogate this. When did the pain start? Was it related to a particular activity or injury? Did it develop over time? Was it immediately severe or did it slowly increase in magnitude? Is it there all the time? Such as a pathological cause related to infection or tumor or episodic which might be due to pushing the lawnmower once a week. Has it deteriorated over time? How frequently does it occur? Is it back or is it leg pain? How debilitating is this pain? Does it reduce activity, sleep, work? Does the valsalva make the pain in the leg worse? Are there effects on bladder and bowel? Is there weight loss? We need to ask about what modalities a patient has had so far. Have they been through physiotherapy? Have they tried weight loss? Have they worked on their core strengths? Have they had any form of intervention by the surgeons? And at this point, we should have a differential diagnosis in broad groups deciding is this a nerve compression syndrome? Is this largely related to back pain? Are there features that concern us about, that may threaten the patient's life or limb? We then need a holistic picture of this patient in terms of their past medical history. Do they have peripheral vascular disease? Do they have other joint involvement suggesting an inflammatory arthropathy? Do they have factors that may put, increase their risk if we operate, such as blood pressure, ischemic heart disease? Do they use medication, which might increase bleeding? Ask specifically about things like hypertension, depression, which patients often neglect to tell us. Whether they use homeopathic agents. If a genetic condition is suspected, inquire about family members. Do they have similar pathology? Ask about previous surgery. Are there social stresses? We need to understand how this patient lives. What are their expectations? Do they have stairs to climb? Do they smoke? Is there a risk of the bones not healing after fusion? Are they excessive drinkers? What work do they do? Is this compatible with the type of surgery that we can offer? Can we meet their expectations in terms of their sports and hobbies? 
Now, there's many patients that will present with back pain, and the vast majority of these are due to normal degenerative processes, and most of that, that back pain can be controlled with non-surgical measures at primary care level, including expectation management, exercise, reassurance. But there will be some conditions that need accelerated investigation and management. If a patient is under the age of 20 or older than 55 when the pain starts, this would be considered more likely to have a more serious underlying pathology. Here's an example of a 16-year-old girl with continuous pain and loss of weight. This is clearly a red flag and requires immediate x-rays as opposed to reassurance or non-operative care. Here's an AP x-ray and on the AP x-ray we identify the pedicles bilaterally. We identify the spinous process at each level. We can see the outline of the vertebral bodies. And on this vertebra here, it's L3, 5, 4, 3. You can see the vertebral body end plate superiorly, lateral wall, inferior end plate, with a large lytic lesion here. Something has destroyed the inferior aspect of L3. If we look at the lateral, again we can see a vertebral body, another vertebral body. If we look at the, the disc spaces, they increase in height as we come down except here, back to being normal. There's loss of height, there's kyphosis, forward bend of the vertebra, kyphosis, loss of disc height, and a sclerotic line in the vertebra which correlates with this defect over here. You can see the sclerotic line there. Something has destroyed part of that vertebra, and in this case is most likely to be an infective process and probably tuberculosis. Should there be a history of violent trauma, fall from a height or car accident, immediate investigation required. Here is a patient that presented to me some years ago, again AP x-ray. If you look at the lines down the anterior column, you can see there is widening of T of L1, widening of L1. If we look at the pedicles and the distance between the pedicles, it's quite clearly the distance has increased. There's generally a slow increase as we descend to the, from the cephalid to caudal end of the spine. But as you can see, this one is out of keeping. The, the distance between the pedicles is larger at this level than the next level. On the lateral, we can see the collapse anteriorly. We can see the retropulsion. Normally, the vertebra have a concavity at the posterior aspect of the body. Here, it is a convexity. There is compression into the canal. The MRI scan confirms increased signal in this vertebra, signs of bleeding and narrowing in, a cortical, in the canal. You can see here's the spinal cord. Here is the conus at the, termin, at the terminal end of the spinal cord before it becomes a cord equina. She had compression of the conus and had incontinence. Patients with constant progressive non-mechanical pain. Here's a patient who presents with con unremitting late onset pain. He's older. You do an x-ray. You can see osteophytes. But this is all in keeping with normal aging. There's a degenerate and uh, loss of disc space height at L5 is one, but this patient, this x-ray could be painful or not painful patient. Due to the unremitting ongoing pain, this patient requires investigation by blood, full blood count, CRP, ESR, as well as an MRI scan. And on his MRI, you can see he confirmed the degenerative discs, but his right facet joint over here is destroyed compared to the left one where there is bone, bone with a joint. Here you can see there's destruction and this patient in fact had a septic arthritis of his facet joint. Another patient with unremitting back pain and right leg weakness needs an x-ray immediately because of his red flag. You can see if you carefully look at the vertical bodies there is loss of definition of the vertebra. If you do, if you look closely, you can see all these other vertebrae have quite crisp end plates and uh, sides of the body here. It's, it seems to be moth-eaten. And on MRI scan, quite clearly there has been replacement of that vertebra with hypo-intense tissue. This is a T1 sequence. You can recognize that because T2 water is white and, and T1 water is dark. This is very, T2 sequences are very good for looking for cancer, and this is a metastatic cancer of the vertebra with a pathological fracture.
and we would go on to resect that and reconstruct it. Patients with thoracic pain need early investigation, history of previous cancer. Here's a patient with multiple levels of metastatic breast CA. Patient with recent systemic steroids, they get osteoporosis and you can see this patient has got osteoporotic collapse of the vertebra, confirmed on MRI scan. And we can repair this with a cement injection into that vertebra. Unexplained weight loss. Here's a patient with typical paraspinal abscess. Kyphosis. There's two vertebrae in here. If you look at the vertebral bodies, you see the pedicle. Here you see a vertebral body, a pedicle, and another vertebral body with a pedicle. So there's a pedicle there. Pedicle there. So we know this is two vertebral bodies with a destroyed disc, collapsed down kyphosis. This is pathognomotic of spinal tuberculosis. Another child, 14-year-old girl, came in holding a neck with pain. We can see the kyphosis, abnormal vertebra, massively swollen soft tissue. Look at the soft tissue here. Features of sclerotic thoracic spine. MRI scan shows pus at C12, pus down the front of the cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine. And this is pathognomonic of, palm, of, of spinal tuberculosis. And any patient with restriction of lumbar flexion um, and widespread neurological signs requires investigation. A young boy, about 14 years of age, um, presents with myelopathy, and you can see there's a congenital abnormality, congenital kyphoscoliosis. These are two different patients um, presented with the same weakness. You can see the spinal cord being compressed. So our role as a physician is to take a complete history, a complete physical examination from general palpation of the spine, neurological assessment of power, sensation, reflexes, looking for straight leg raise and femoral stretch signs, excluding hip pathology, and checking the distal pulses. At that point, we can decide whether special investigations are necessary, which may include a blood workup, typically a full blood count and ESR or CRP to exclude infection, x-rays to look for structural changes, and possibly an MRI scan if indicated. X-rays are of limited use but readily available. They have a poor correlation between degenerative changes and back pain. Because most of us as we age will have degeneration. But here's an example of the normal vertebra, whereas L5 has slipped forward. If we draw the line on the back of S1, you can see L5 has slipped right forward. You can see the back of the vertebral body is there and should go down here. This has slipped forward by 50%. This is due to a defect in the pars interarticularis. You can see the pedic pedicle here, supraarticular process, inferarticular process left behind the defect here. This is an example of a spondylolytic, L-Y-T-I-C, spondylolytic spondylolisthesis. MRI scans are very useful to show us most of the pathology. And here we can see a left-sided disc herniation. This is a S1 vertebral body. And there's a nerve root on the one side. And here's a mass into the foramen, pushing away the nerve root and the fecal sac. One needs to decide where is the compression. Is it static or dynamic? In other words, is there a lysesis, which improves when they lie down, but slips forward when they stand up? Is the pain more involving one nerve root, like L5 or S1, or more global, involving both legs? Is there central stenosis, or more typically, lateral stenosis? Most people will develop facet arthritis, which causes some compression in the lateral recess, which is underneath the facet. This area is called the lateral recess, just medial to the pedicle, where the nerve root runs. And typically, it will be bilateral like that. It, the compression can be in the foramen or extrapyramidally. Here's an example of an MRI scan. You can see hypertrophy of the facet joints with narrowing of the lateral recesses. You can see how they impinge in to the thecal sac and cause this compression. Here's an example of a small disc herniation. Uh, again, sorry, over here, you can see small disc protrusion over here with narrowing, but again, facet hypertrophy, fluid effusions in the facet joints. Here's an example of a sequestrated disc, disc herniation. And on the same patient's axial imaging, you can see the 
fecal sac, nerve root on the left, on the right hand side, large chunk of sequestrated disc. Here's an a diagram of the fecal sac, the exiting nerve root, coming around the pedicles, and you can see when you get an, this is the level of L4, when you get a 4-5 paracentral disc herniation, which is the commonest, it comes out and pushes the exiting L, traversing over here, and then exiting L5 nerve root. That's why the L4-5 disc will give you L5 symptoms, and the L5-S1 disc will give you S1 symptoms. Patient's head's up here, buttock, buttock's down here, and you can see there, this is a four millimeter hook. The nerve root's been, the, the thecal sac's been pulled medially. There's lying the nerve root, and there's a piece, a piece of disc coming through between the thecal sac and the exiting nerve root, and you can see a small epidural vein on top of that disc. Sometimes the, the disc will uh, tear into the foramen. You can see here, the disc is actually more laterally. Typically, they're here. But here's more laterally, and that will go into the so-called keyhole or foramen. You can see here's a foramen, nerve root. You're not seeing the nerve root very well here due to the disc going up and pressing on it. It can be very subtle. Here you can see an MRI scan of a patient, all these normal discs, slight loss of fluid content, small disc protrusion there. Small disc, you can see how the small disc, just lifting up that annulus, you can see the tear over there. You see that white area, hyperintense area. Um, again, hyperintense area, indicative of a tear, and the nerve root coming out being irritated by that. Here's an example of extrapyramidal disc herniation, large extrapyramidal disc herniation. Remember, the nerve roots come out here where they're typically compressed, out the hole, out the front, and if there's a disc over here, it can cause compression extrapyramidally. For back pain, where we think the facets might be causing the pain, we can inject them with um, steroids and local anesthetic for temporary relief. But remember, not every back pain is spinal pain. Here's a 15-year-old girl presented with severe back pain. MRI scan was normal. ESR was raised. And if you look very carefully, you'll see hyperintense tissue out here on the left hand side. This hyperintense area is the aorta. She's got massive inflammatory tissue around there. In fact, on the autogram you can see changes to the whole vascular structure, all the scalloping indicative of a inflammatory aortitis, Takayasu's aortitis. Not every leg pain is spinal. L5 nerve roots to go through the pelvis and can be irritated by an ovary. They run past the sacroiliac joint, and infection of the sacroiliac joint or fractures can cause symptoms, and hip pathology can result in it as well. Once we've done a complete history, physical examination, special investigations, excluded dangerous pathologies, we can select the few patients that require surgery and advise the others on non-surgical management. Now we need to adapt or meet patient expectations and problem areas would be those that want to go back to running when they have degenerative back pain or play golf and one has to be sensible about this and not simply operate on these people um, if they need to adapt their lifestyles. What treatment modalities do we have? Well the vast majority of patients that present complaining of back pain will not need surgery. They can be reassured that this is a normal aging process that they can optimize it with a short period of rest if they have back pain. They can use anti-inflammatory medications such as the non-steroidals, um, use paracetamol, occasionally codeine, occasionally an opiate. Physiotherapy to teach them how to look after their backs, to strengthen their abdominal core by exercise and obviously if they're obese or overweight to lose weight. There's a benefit to staying active. Now, there are lots of interventions one can uh, perform anywhere from conservative up to spinal fusion surgery. There are a few injections when one can be done. Unfortunately, this is often abused um, as it is quite lucrative and they have limited value and limited duration of action. Epidural steroids can be useful for patients with sciatica where they have severe leg pain 
as natural history, most of them will resolve with natural history. And if you can suppress the symptoms for a few weeks, they may not come to surgery. Here the uh, caudal hiatus is injected with dye to confirm we're in the right place and then steroid and, in, and marcane injected to take away the pain. Acupuncture, it's limited evidence, but uh, some people use it for, for back pain. Exercise therapy is useful. Education, definitely useful. Um, if it comes to surgery, if we have leg or buttock pain due to confirmed disc herniation on MRI scan, concordant with the symptoms, we can do a discectomy. It's a small operation, takes about an hour. Patient stays in hospital for about one to two days. It's a small four to five centimeter incision where we simply remove that piece of disc to take it off the nerve root with immediate resolution of leg pain. The only absolute indication is Corday Kwana syndrome. This is when there's bladder and bowel incontinence or uh, perineal loss of sensation. The rest are relative. If the patient's coping with the discomfort, they can continue with a high expectation of recovery. If the pain is debilitating, they're requiring high levels of opiates, it's reasonable to get on and do the surgery. It will not change the natural history of the, of the degeneration, but relieve the symptoms in a high percentage of cases, approaching 100%. Surgery for back pain is very different. Um, it's never complete relief. It has it creates problems of its own. And in principle, the better the selection of the patient, the better the results. If there's a lysesis, they do very well. And they need to be socially, emotionally, psychologically well balanced. We would operate for chronic back pain if we identify the cause. If it's only the symptoms are present for longer than six months, they require daily analgesics. It's interfering with work and the enjoyment of life. They failed the non-operative process. Um, there are many concerns with fusion, as there are many poor results in up to 30% of patients, and we need to be sure we're selecting the right patient, minimizing muscle damage when we operate. We are fusing one level. We're taking away motion of one lumbar level when we perform fusion surgery for back pain. This increases the stress on the other levels, and... Um, in time, the other levels will degenerate and require further surgery. So we must be very careful before starting this process. We often add instrumentation, screws and rods to hold the bone in place. And we pack bone either from the patient or from the bank, a bone bank to cause a biological fusion process. We have multiple options of instrumentation, which are expensive and bring their own dangers, but provide immediate stability control the vertebrae in space and we can correct deformity, allow early mobilization, increase our fusion rates. But they increase the rate of neurological injury, they prolong, prolong operative time, may increase the surgical exposure, increase the infection risk and add tremendous expense with screws costing around 5,000 Rand each and some of those cages 10 to 15,000 Rand. And here's an example of a misplaced screw which has gone through the canal and caused nerve damage. And it can also cause non-union, accelerated degeneration of the levels above and injury to the surrounding tissue. We can do the surgery from the front called an anterior lumbar interbody fusion where we put these cages from the front, we open the belly, remove the disc, place a cage with bone graft to create the fusion. Or we can go from behind where we um, remove the facet joints at the back, remove the disc, and either pack bone in or a cage um, around the front to support the vertebra. Here's an example of a patient with a severe slip. You can see there's a lysis here. So this is a lytic lysesis with a grade 4 to 5 slip. Here's the MRI scan, which confirms the foraminal stenosis. You can see there's the pedicle of L5, the L5 nerve root exec underneath, and the, because of the slip, the severe disc compression over there. You can see how the whole disc is rolled up. And this can be reduced, pulled back with the screws and an interbody cage via the transferaminal interbody fusion process. This is a cage that's been placed there. It's actually a block of plastic with little markers. It's not just a rugby ball pole like that is actually a block but the markers are there so we can see where it is. So our success depends primarily on a correct diagnosis, meeting patient or adjusting patient expectations, 
using appropriate modalities from reassurance, exercise, physiotherapy, all the way to surgery, taking into account the risks and benefits of each. Thanks very much.